Today we're talking about two blockbuster cases that could reshape AI in our lives. As we all know, AI is like a digital Frankenstein's monster. It's powerful, unpredictable, and maybe a little scary. It could steal jobs, spread deep fakes, or even outsmart us all. But let's wait a minute. What if the real monster is overzealous government rules that crush innovation before it even gets started? Let's break down a few new court battles, and I'll play devil's advocate to keep things interesting along the way. I want to pause for just a minute to note thank you to everyone who tuned in last week because I tried something a little different for our channel that I thought was going to be rather boring, uh, an analysis about alliances on the Supreme Court, but it turned out being one of our most popular videos. I'm not sure why, but I want to keep producing high quality content for everyone. So if you have suggestions about topics or issues you'd like addressed, be sure to leave them below. But let's jump into today's video. Imagine a brilliant artist with a bold vision, but no paintbrush. Instead, they have an AI. This scenario is at the heart of Thaler v. Perlmutter, a recent case testing whether art created by artificial intelligence can be copyrighted. The lower courts have bluntly answered no, ruling that a machine can't be the legal author of a copyrighted work. In Dr. Thaler's case, his AI system, the Creativity Machine, generated an image entirely on its own, with no human brushstrokes. Thaler listed the AI as the sole author on the copyright application, and the Copyright Office rejected it. The rationale is pretty simple. Under U.S. law, human authorship is a bedrock requirement for copyright protection. A machine, the court said, cannot own property, cannot sign documents, doesn't have a lifespan for copyright term calculations, all things that copyright law assumes authors have. Now, there are some blurry lines in these cases. The Thaler case is weird because Thaler deliberately set it up to have AI try to claim ownership for something it made almost or maybe entirely on its own. But a lot of these things involve varying degrees of human input and creativity. Knowing what's protected and what's not is difficult for the courts. In other words, it's testing the difference between just using a tool and the tool at some point itself having the right to own a work. But is that the right conclusion? Let's build a contrarian case. One that asks, should it matter how art is made, as long as a human mind is behind it? Let's consider a different perspective. If a human being comes up with a creative concept, why should they lose rights just because they used AI to execute it? The law protects the expression of ideas by humans. Using an AI is simply a new way to express human creativity. It's the person's vision and originality that matter. Denying copyright in such cases could penalize artists for their choice of a tool. Now, we already treat many tools and technologies as neutral aids in the creative process. A camera can capture an image, but the photographer's creative choices, lighting, angle, composition, make the photo copyrightable as their original work. In fact, when photography was new in the 19th century, skeptics argued photos weren't art because a machine made them. The Supreme Court disagreed, holding that a photograph was an original work of art. By analogy, an AI program is like an advanced camera or a paintbrush. It may autonomously generate some details, but if it's guided by a human's prompts and selections, why isn't it just another artistic instrument? Relying on others or on tools for assistance has never disqualified a human creator from protection. If a disabled painter directs a studio assistant to apply paint where they want it, the finished canvas still belongs to the painter. Similarly, an artist might use a software algorithm, a musical synthesizer, or an AI image generator to bring their ideas to life. These are extensions of the artist's ability. The law already allows collaboration and assistance. It doesn't void an author's rights just because they didn't physically hold a pen. Why should using AI be any different? Notably, some courts have hinted that works with AI assistance would be protected if a human's creative input is substantial. Here's a constitutional twist. What about the First Amendment? Creating art, music, writing is an exercise of free expression. If I use a newfangled tool, AI, to express myself, it's still my expression. The First Amendment has always been technology neutral. It protects your speech regardless of the tool used to create, produce, or transmit it. Using an AI to generate content is akin to using a microphone or an amplifier for your voice. 
it makes your expression louder or more elaborate. But the speaker is still you. If the law refuses to recognize AI-assisted work as your creation at all, that raises a concern. It's essentially saying because you spoke through a machine, we don't acknowledge your speech. That kind of stance could chill creative speech. To drive home the point, consider an interesting analogy from a recent filing. Dr. Thaler warned that if we rigidly insist on human-only, no machines in authorship, we might endanger things like photography itself. That's because many creative works are produced with technological assistance. If an AI's touch voids copyright, could a strict interpretation put high-tech art or digitally aided works at risk? Thaler argued that the current rule, if consistently enforced, could spell the end of copyright protection for many photographs and other works created with technological assistance. The counterargument from the courts is that we do still incentivize human creators. People can use AI. They just need to contribute original expression somewhere in the process. And admittedly, there's a slippery slope here. How much human input is enough? That line is blurry and will be the subject of many fights to come. But from my perspective, we should be pushing for a unifying principle. As long as a real person's creativity is driving the work, the law should find a way to protect it, AI or no AI. Denying that protection not only clashes with how we treat other artistic tools, it could also clash with basic free expression values. Now, shift from the art studio to the halls of power. In TechCore versus FTC, Federal Trade Commission, the fight isn't about who owns AI creations, it's about who controls AI's fate. The case now is before the Supreme Court and it asks whether federal agencies like the FTC have the authority to regulate artificial intelligence without a clear green light from Congress. On one side, the FTC argues that it can police AI under its broad mandate to protect consumers and ensure fair competition. AI is new, sure, but the FTC says it falls under existing laws about deceptive practices, product safety, data privacy, so on. In its view, waiting for Congress to pass an AI-specific law isn't necessary or could be too slow to address real dangers. On the other side, TechCore is saying not, not so fast. Their position is that unless Congress explicitly wrote to regulate AI into a law, an agency has no business making up sweeping AI rules. Let elected lawmakers decide the big stuff. If agencies act on their own, it's not just bureaucratic overreach, it might be unconstitutional. TechCore invokes the idea that agencies can't decide major questions on their own. Big policy moves need clear congressional authorization. And regulating the entire AI industry is a pretty major question as a $500 billion sector hangs in the balance. This debate taps into the Supreme Court's skepticism of regulators going rogue. You may have heard of this major questions doctrine. If an agency tries to do something that's huge and new that impacts the whole economy or society, courts will ask, did Congress really give you that power? If not, the agency's move likely gets struck down. For example, last year the EPA was told it couldn't impose a nationwide carbon cap without clear authority. In plain terms, unelected regulators shouldn't make the rules for AI on their own. Why would we fear that? Because a heavy-handed approach to a nascent technology can backfire in spectacular ways. History gives us cautionary tales. For instance, in the 1990s, the US government grew anxious about strong encryption technology, the stuff that keeps your online data secure. They proposed the Clipper chip, a built-in backdoor for law enforcement in consumer encryption devices. It was basically an attempt to regulate a then new tech digital cryptography by mandating government access. The result? Massive public backlash. Experts warned it would cripple security and trust in emerging online services. Eventually, the plan was abandoned by 1996 amidst flaws and opposition. But had that overreach succeeded, it could have severely stunted e-commerce and internet privacy before they even took off. Overregulation can strangle innovation, driving researchers and startups overseas or underground. That's not to say no rules at all. Even TechCore likely agrees some guardrails are needed, but the how and who of rulemaking authority matter. 
Should it be a deliberative legislative process where public debate shapes new laws or a quick regulatory fix by an agency adapting old laws like consumer protection statutes to this new frontier? The fear is that a rush to regulate AI fueled by doomsday headlines about rogue AI hobgoblins could lead to poorly conceived rules. And unlike code, law isn't easy to patch once it's in place. Overreach by the feds might not only overshoot their legal authority, it could slow down beneficial AI research and drive talent away. As one commentator put it, we must remember that every transformative tech, from the telegraph to the automobile, was once feared, but humanity reaped huge benefits once the initial panic subsided. Tech Corps of the FTC is here to address this tension. It will likely bring up the Constitution's separation of powers. Essentially, can the FTC self-deputize as the AIs are without Congress? A clear Supreme Court ruling here could either unleash the FTC and other federal agencies to issue AI rules or rein them in under the notion that Congress must speak first on big questions. Think of it this way. Should federal agencies need a congressional blessing to regulate new developments in technology? How the court answer this will set the course for AI governance in the U.S. As we stand today, AI technology is a galloping ahead like a wild stallion, and the law is racing to catch up. It feels a bit like the Wild West of AI legal development, in that it's unpredictable, it's exciting, and maybe a little scary. On one hand, we have incredible creations and possibilities coming from AI. On the other hand, many people are afraid, will AI generate misinformation, steal jobs, become too powerful to control? Remember, even the first automobiles were met with fear. With AI, that apprehension is amplified. But here's the twist in our story. Often the more immediate threat isn't the technology itself, but overzealous attempts to control it. Government solutions, especially rushed or heavy ones, can wind up scarier than the innovation they aim to tame. It turns out Aunt Jane using AI to create a lovely piece of art or a personalized poem is maybe not so frightening. She's just embracing a new medium. Should the law really treat her as if she's done something wrong or unworthy by using AI? Instead of fearing Aunt Jane's creative experiments, maybe we should fear a regime that says only traditional, old-fashioned methods count as legitimate. That kind of thinking would have left us without photography, without digital art, even without word processors. Why? Because the legal protections behind these technologies matter. We're at a pivotal moment. Courts and lawmakers are making history with each AI case and statute, sketching the first boundaries on a blank map. It's vital that we balance caution with freedom. Free speech and creative freedom must remain at the forefront. If someone's using an AI as an amplifier for their voice, the law should hear them loud and clear. In constitutional terms, the person behind the AI isn't too many steps removed from the output. Often, they're the driving force and intent behind it. As one free speech advocacy group noted, suppressing AI-generated expression or deeming it unworthy of protection would give government vast power without any constitutional limit to regulate what we may say and how we may say it. That's a future to avoid at all costs. So, yes, it's the Wild West. There are outlaws and there will be sheriffs. But before we panic and build a bigger jail than we need, let's remember how past frontiers were won. Open opportunity, protection for pioneers or creators, and sensible rules after we understand the lay of the land, not before. AI is a frontier of creativity, innovation. The law's job is to cultivate it safely, not to cordon it off with fear. As we watch cases unfold, keep an eye on that broader story, because that's where the tension point is going to lie. We're learning how to live with our new AI life and writing the rule book as we go. In a decade, we'll look back at these first battles as the moments that shape the relationship between artificial intelligence and the law, determining whether we face the future with courage or clipped its wings out of fear. And if history is any guide, betting on human ingenuity and freedom, even in the age of AI, will lead to a happier ending. What do you think? AI is savior or is it a doom bringer? Drop your comments below, and if you have hints about how the law should approach AI, I'd welcome those too. I'm Benjamin Barr, and my job as a constitutional litigator is to give you the tools necessary to solve today's constitutional controversies. Please be sure to like and subscribe as it helps our educational project, and join us next week as we tackle yet another 
constitutional controversy.